we, we've all heard the expression that there are three kinds of people. There are those that make things happen. There are those who watch things happen. And then there are those that say, what happened? <laughs> and when it comes to your retirement, you really don't want to be the second kind. And you definitely don't want to be the third kind. Things are very uncertain in today's world. And I think now is the time to review your investment strategy to make sure it still fits your retirement goals and your risk tolerance. Your investment strategy is a crucial part of your retirement plan, and you don't want it to be vulnerable to a potential major market correction, especially in these certain times. At the same point, you need growth to beat inflation. So creating your financial plan starts by taking a good look at where we are, where we may be headed, and what it is you want to accomplish with your money. So let's talk about where the market could be headed and what that might mean for you. Um, you know, when, when I look at economists right now, those who have a pessimistic outlook on the market outnumber those with an optimistic outlook, according to a recent survey. Uh, few invest, few, the few investors who are optimistic about U.S. stocks over the next six months to a year, according to an RBC Capital Market sur survey, have nearly vanished. And this is the first time since mid-2019 that pessimists or bears outnumber optimists or bulls in this poll. Now, to be clear, this is a poll, a poll of consumers like yourselves. 30% are bearish and 3% are very bearish and 46% are neutral. And I think that's partially due to the Federal Reserve's tightening monetary policy and raising of interest rates. And then, of course, you've got the high inflation in the Russia-Ukraine war. Gas prices, overall inflation remain high. But we should be careful with things like this. You know, Warren Buffett has an old expression you may have heard. When people get greedy, I get scared. And when people get scared, I get greedy. And there's a lot to be said for that. Now, I'm not saying because more people are bearish on the market than they are bullish that the market go out and buy stocks. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying we have to be very careful about investor sentiment. Investor sentiment can certainly have an impact in the short term. You know, something could happen in a week or in a month that, you know, drives markets, but, you know, based on short-term reactions. But, you know, typically market fundamentals are going are gonna to rue the day. So, you know, we do need to be careful with that. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. I get asked, I've been asked many, many times in the last several months, Jim, how can we invest to beat inflation? What are some investments that will allow us to beat inflation? And the number one investment asset class to beat inflation is stocks. So that's very interesting because, you know, we think of things like, I mean, there are, all, there are other ways to specifically hedge short-term inflation. Things like commodities, energy, natural resources, anything that's priced in dollars. Uh, certainly... Inflation, you know, I-bonds, inflation-protected bonds. There's different things that can specifically hedge inflation. But, in the, you know, over time, stock, the stock market's the best way to, to fight inflation. The problem is, in the short term, you can have a lot of volatility and risk. So, you know, one of the keys to being successful is to stay invested. Because we never know where the next bear market or next bull market is going to happen. I mean, if we did, we certainly don't want to be in in a bear market. But we want to be in when the markets are, are up. So something to consider about market timing. You know, if you invested in, if you had been invested in the S&P 500 from 2000 to 2019, your annualized, so that's a 20-year period, Right starting at the start of this deck of this century. Your annualized return would be 6% per year over that term. But if you were not invested for the best 10 days out of the 5,000 days that we've seen, then you would have only been up 2.4% per year instead of 6% per year. 
So it, you know, we have to be very careful with timing and investor sentiment and, you know, when people are getting a little bit nervous, oh, let's run for the hills, or when people are getting bullish, let's buy more. I mean, we have to be careful with that kind of stuff. Now, everyone's got a, a different risk tolerance, and usually as you get closer to retirement and then you retire, most people's risk tolerance goes down. I think one of the keys is to build a, a, a base of retirement income. Sources of income that don't go down in the event of a market crash that produce enough income to cover your monthly expenses. So you could draw from things from like bank assets, individual bonds, uh, fixed annuities, which are like a, CD, a good word for that is CD type of annuities or guaranteed interest contracts, which are like CDs but within insurance companies. So there's different ways to have things that are stable that don't go down in market conditions that you can draw from so that you can stay invested. What you don't want to be doing is living on those investments that are going up and down, because inevitably they will be down, and you don't want to be selling them when, they, when they're down and then spending the money, because that money will never come back. It's been spent for income. It's okay to sell something when it's down and reinvest, but you never want to sell it when it's down and spend it. You know, you don't want to withdraw early from your IRA or your 401k, and that may be tempting during volatile periods, but it's typically not a good idea to cash out of your 401k. And if you withdraw money before your age 59 and a half, you typically would be subject to an early withdrawal penalty of 10% in addition to the income taxes. And we really don't want to make decisions based on emotions. This can be an easy trap to fall into when your financial security is at risk. You know, you may want to pull, you pull all your money from the market when, in a, when it drops in an attempt to save your investments, but it may be a wiser to, to allow time for the market to recover. Now, we, we know we want to buy low and sell high, right? So I think one of the things that's important in a financial plan right now is that you have ways, you know, it's not only being able, when, when markets are down, you, you know, you need time to be able to recover, and that's where your income plan comes into play. But wouldn't it also be good if when markets are sharply down, you could deploy more capital, more investment into the market while it's down, and then when it simply recovers to break even, you've actually made money because you were putting more investment into the market when it was down. And there are, there are strategies, there are ways to be able to do that. There are mutual funds and ETFs that have levers, for lack of a better word, in the in their portfolio that get pulled when markets are sharply down and produce more money, more capital that can then be reinvested when markets are down and then when you see recovery, those markets can recover. So don't get freaked out by the news. It's certainly important to know what's going on. There is such a thing as being too glued to the media. Headlines often report a worst case scenario or even exaggerate in order to get as many eyes as possible. So just remember what they're trying to do there. Now it is important to get information and make a plan. And that's so critically important is to know, you, you know, I had a friend whose father-in-law, uh, he doesn't live in this market, my friend lives over in North Carolina, and his father-in-law, um, one of his friends had been pitching him a specific investment. It was a closed-in mutual fund and it, just a specific investment. I don't want to get too much into the weeds of how that work, uh, closed-in mutual fund works. The point is he was, being, he was pitching his dad a specific investment, and my friend was wanting me to give him advice on that investment. And I did, but the, you know, I always feel like I'm doing things in a vacuum when I'm evaluating a specific investment without knowing anything else. Like, what are the client's other holdings? What are their goals? What are their needs for income? How long is it going to be before they need to start drawing money? And when they do need to start drawing income, how much will it be? You know, what are their tax planning opportunities? There's so many things that come into play. So I always feel like if, I don't, if that's all I know, what do you think, Jim, what do you think of this stock or this fund or this whatever? I feel like I'm in a vacuum. How much are you wanting to put into it? How much other money do you have? How else are you invested? So, 
you know, I think it's important that you do things all within the construct of an overall plan where you have specific goals and outcomes you want to achieve. Now, that doesn't mean you can't speculate some. If you want to take a small piece and speculate on a few stocks, that's okay. But it's how, and then it is important, what do I think of those stocks? What does the research say? But how does it overall fit into your overall plan? So I talk about this in my class, Financial Survival for Retirement, and my next class is at the University of Tennessee. I'd love to see you there. You can go to financialsurvivalforretirement.com to find out more. It is on April the 26th and May the 3rd. Two two-hour sessions, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., again, April 26th and May the 3rd. Financial Survival for Retirement. The course fee is $59 for a married couple. Uh, I think it's either $89 or $99. But I cover seven major areas that I think everybody needs to be aware of in their financial plan for retirement specifically. So if you're getting close to retirement or you're already retired, I'd love to see you there. Again, go to financialsurvivalforretirement.com. You can download a syllabus and click to register. Now, when we come back... We're going to get more into things that you need to be aware of in this challenging and volatile world to secure your financial future. So stay with us. This is More Living with Jim Brogan right here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to News Talk 98.7's Brogan Financial Studios, where Jim Brogan is coming to you live with important news and advice to help you achieve your dream retirement. Get ready to learn and live. Here's your host, Jim Brogan. This is More Living, and we have so much stuff going on in the world, so much uncertainty, and I believe we do have or are in the process of getting Victor Ash on the line. Uh, while we're waiting on that, I do want to mention uh, one of the things that's come up recently is will you see cryptocurrency in your 401k? You know, our world changes so rapidly, and learning new things and adapting is very necessary. So this is especially true with investing. And you might be hearing a lot about cryptocurrency and how there's a push to have it in 401ks. So what's being floated and what does that really mean? What is cryptocurrency? You know, I could probably do uh, two hours of a show on cryptocurrency and it might not still be clear of what it is. But... Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are not stocks. It's technically software that creates virtual money through the use of, crypto, of cryptography. Now, what is cryptography? It is the science of making and breaking codes. Cryptocurrencies are decentralized. They're not backed by precious metals or, or governments. And that's one of their big attractions is there's no government backing. Now, you may have seen recently that uh, the Biden administration has proposed that they are created a committee or whatever, a commission, whatever they call it, to, uh, to study uh, a federal cryptocurrency. That seems kind of silly to me. It kind of defeats the point because uh, then it would be regulated and not as decentralized. Uh, but that's one of the attractiveness uh, or attractive things about cryptocurrencies and recently, some financial institutions have started marketing cryptocurrency investments as potential options in 401ks. Financial institutions are looking to increase returns and are more optimistic about cryptocurrency, but the U.S. Department of Labor recently came out with a strong warning about cryptocurrencies pushing their way into 401ks. They're concerned that cryptocurrency investments would be pushed onto people, many of whom don't understand what they're being charged in fees or what investing in crypto fully means for them. There are ways to invest in cryptocurrency through publicly traded securities, and then there are also ways to buy the cryptocurrency. I'm not going to get into a lot of those fine details today. I think the thing I want to impress upon you is it's still a very speculative, volatile investment. You've got the two major ones, which is Bitcoin and Ethereum, that have been largely embraced by the institutional investment world. 
And then you got all these others like Dogecoin and they're just XRP Ripple. They're just all these other kinds. And, and the big thing I would say about that is it is still sp highly speculative and volatile. So, you know, it can be an inflation hedge. Some people see it as that, but it is very risky. It's more risky than gold could end up being a better hedge than gold. Some people view it as an as an, an alternative to gold or precious metals as an inflation hedge. Uh, bottom line, again, it goes back to what I said in the first segment, any specific investment should always be looked at as how does this fit into your overall plan? And something that's extremely speculative and volatile should be a very, very small piece of your plan.